Hello everyone, my name is Nora Castle and I'm a PhD student at the University of Warwick in the UK. Today I will be presenting Everything Here Survives at the Mercy of His Balance, Agriculture and Ideology in Closed Loop Future Imaginaries. I'll begin by talking about the idea of the lifeboat narrative before turning to close readings from two different narrative worlds, that of Snowpiercer and that of Hugh Howey's Silo series. These close readings will focus on the connection between the organization of agriculture and people, looking particularly at how formulations of agricultural ecologies translate to understandings of a larger world ecology. Janet Fiscio discusses the lifeboat narrative in her article, Apocalypse and Ecotopia, Narratives in Global Climate Change Discourse. She explains that in the lifeboat narrative scenario, quote, competition for scarce resources requires ruthless decisions, but holds out the possibility of creating a sustainable, if exclusive, society, end quote. The lifeboat narrative is grounded in social Darwinism and the, quote, idea of human nature as a struggle for survival, end quote. The lifeboat narrative is built on two premises. The first is the assumption that humans will be motivated first and foremost by their own self-interest. The second is that a politics of exclusion will be enacted to create a sustainable society. Lifeboat ethics has roots in xenophobic Malthusian discourse, including the tragedy of the commons. Fiscio explains, quote, at stake in this discourse is the question of who will be allowed in the lifeboat, i.e. whose bodies will be included in the nation, end quote. Significantly, Fiscio grounds her discussion, which focuses on speculative fiction in global climate change discourse, particularly in terms of climate refugees. The two narrative worlds I will discuss today both implicate climate change in their narratives. Snowpiercer is set after a failed geoengineering experiment that was meant to combat climate change instead plunges the world into a new ice age. The remains of humanity are concentrated on a train built and controlled by a Mr. Wilford that circles the world continuously thanks to its eternal engine. The ticketed passengers were all vetted by Mr. Wilford, but a number of climate refugees were able to forcibly board the train, becoming what are called tailies, who are relegated to the back of the train with little to no resources allocated to them. Hugh Howey's Silo series is set after an atmospheric terrorism event in which the air was no longer safe to breathe, and humanity was encased in an underground bunker hundreds of levels deep. In later installments of this series, we learn that, and sorry for spoilers, there are, or were, 50 of these bunkers, and that the inhabitants of Silo 1 were the ones to create the disaster in order to control who would survive in their Silo lifeboat. Society in the bunkers is strictly regulated, just as there are classes and sections that are closely guarded on the train as world of Snowpiercer, the Silo inhabitants are divided by their floors and professions, which are easily discernible from the colors of their overalls. In both narrative worlds, and I say narrative worlds because both are transmedia narratives, with Snowpiercer spanning across graphic novels of film and a television series, and the Silo series spanning across a set of short stories which became a trilogy of novels and a graphic novel. There's a big emphasis on maintaining an ecosystem. The narratives in some ways move away from the nature-humanity divide that Jason Moore discusses as fundamental to Anthropocene thinking, articulating a clear understanding of humans' entanglements with the non-human, but in other ways, they reproduce existing uneven and unequal relations. I argue that the agricultural systems in these narratives, and especially the way these systems are mobilized rhetorically, are particularly evocative of the ideology of each society. The way food is grown and maintained becomes a prism for viewing the way some treat humans treat other humans in these societies. More broadly, these lifeboat narratives, which operate in what Jane Bennett calls the microeconomic mode, by presenting life-or-death scenarios in stripped-down environments, can help illuminate the assumptions and associations about the ways humans relate to one another and to the non-human in our own world, which, as Donna Haraway, Anna Tsing, and others demonstrate through their conception of the plantation scene, are also generally entangled with agricultural systems. I'll start here by looking at two different scenes from two different adaptations of Snowpiercer. The first is the film, directed by Bang Joon-ho, and the second is the Netflix TV series. In terms of the food system in Snowpiercer's narrative world, there are hydroponic farms, and at least in the film, also dirt farms, 
as well as animal agriculture cars and an aquarium which includes fish used for human consumption. I'll now look at two scenes which use food to make a greater statement about how society is set up as on the train as world. The first is the sushi bar scene in the film. In this scene, a group of rebels from the tail has captured an agent of Mr. Wilford called Mason and are marching her up train as a hostage in order to confront Wilford. They walk through the aquarium car and stop in the sushi bar, which is maintained for the first class passengers. The tailies, who are only given bug bar rations normally, stop to eat as Mason explains to them that they are lucky because sushi is only available twice a year. When one rebel asks if it's because there isn't enough fish, Mason replies, quote, Oh, enough is not the criterion. Balance. You see, this aquarium is a closed ecological system, and the number of individual units must be very closely, precisely controlled in order to maintain the proper sustainable balance, end quote. The camera then pans out the window, showing the wrecked container ships of the old world, juxtaposing Snowpiercer's more sustainable system against their unsustainability. Nevertheless, balance here is about control, not about making sure that everyone has enough. This is eerily similar to the way that humans are spoken about in the film. We later learn that the rebellion, which results in the death of many of the train's numbers, was orchestrated with the front of the train as a method of population control. As Wilford himself explains, quote, air, water, food supply, population must always be kept in balance. For optimum balance, however, there have been times when more radical solutions were required, when the population needed to be reduced rather drastically, end quote. The eco-utopic imaginary of a sustainable ecosystem here is used to obscure a profoundly unequal society which treats its lower class citizens as resources, including as spare parts for the engine rather than as people. This is not a system based on community and mutual aid, but rather on the politics of exclusion that Fiscio refers to. As Wilford explains, quote, we need to maintain a proper balance of anxiety and fear, chaos and horror in order to keep going, end quote. The second scene from Snowpiercer is from the series. In it, Leighton, a tailie, is brought up to the front of the train to act as a detective for a murder case. The scene takes place in one of the hydroponic farm cars. Leighton lays out his demands, which he wants met should he solve the murder, which include reproductive rights for the tail. He concludes, quote, If you want to keep eating your damn strawberries, you know my demands, end quote. Melanie, the voice of the train, responds, saying, quote, This looks like abundance to you. It isn't. This is strawberry crop 12 in a balanced rotation of 14. This berry represents five or six kilocalories. Sugars, dietary fiber, vitamin C. Its place here is commensurate with these values. Now, strawberries, they're susceptible to soil fungi, nematodes. So are we, actually. You, me, everyone else on this train, everyone on this train. So we don't let these proliferate, either. Everything here survives at the mercy of his balance. And the truth is, you need Wilford's strawberries more than he needs you, end quote. The control of the population here is equated to the control of agriculture in a similar way to the discipline of people slash discipline of plants conjuncture under their plantation system and its legacy in the capitalist world system in real life, which is discussed uh, in the plantation of scene conversations with Haraway, Singh, and others. The emphasis is on individuals here in the scene as productive units rather than as a community of people working together. In both the film and the series, creating a sustainable ecosystem is not necessarily about creating a just ecosystem, but rather about creating one in which those who were meant to be on the lifeboat are able to flourish, replicating the exclusion of certain classes of human from an understanding of humanity and aligning them instead with nature, in the sense Jason Moore means, even while seemingly cultivating a society more aware of human ecological entanglements. So now I'd like to move on to Hugh Howey's Silo series. I'll focus here on the first book, Wool, as well as the graphic novel adaptation of it. The series as a whole is interesting because the individual silos seem to generally have a more ethical relationship with non-human others and recognize humans' place in a greater ecosystem. It would seem to be more an example of a community narrative rather than of a lifeboat narrative. Silo 1, however, engages in the lifeboat way of thinking 
and the background for why the silos exist and what they are for is certainly part of a politics of exclusion. In terms of food systems, the silos feature both hydroponic and dirt farms, and the food is served primarily in cafeterias. I'll begin with an example of an individual silo from the novel before moving on to one from the graphic novel about the greater silo network and silo one's intentions. In the novel, when a person has died, they are buried in one of the dirt farms so that their bodies help to nourish the soil. On the slide, I've put a longer quote, but I've bolded the most significant portion. So speaking of the two dead, the novel explains, quote, soon the two of them would intermingle inside the plants and these plants would nourish the occupants of the silo, end quote. The funeral rite also includes consuming a piece of produce around the grave, acknowledging the interconnection between life and death, but also importantly, between human life and non-life. So here, Juliet is given a ripe tomato from the priest and she bites into the fruit, quote, allowing a polite amount of juice to splatter her overalls, end quote. In wool, like in Snowpiercer, everyone has their place. Reproduction is strictly regulated, and so is strati social stratification by profession. The structure of the silo, which features an enormous central spiral staircase, facilitates the stratification of society, and we later learn that it was manufactured to do so. Silo 1, which houses cryogenically preserved members of the former U.S., who are awakened for shifts and who control and monitor the other silos, has an elevator. They also only eat canned and prepackaged foods. There are no farms in Silo 1, so the differences in food consumption seem to mirror their differences in worldviews. In the graphic novel, when Juliet, uh, the same member of Silo 18 from the previous slide, uh, manages to survive despite being sent outside the silo to die uh, and makes it to a neighboring silo, where she learns from its seemingly only surviving occupant, Solo, about the whole network of silos. Solo explains, quote, this is a silo. We are the seeds. They put us away for the bad times. The problem is, you can't leave seeds in the dark for this long. They rot. We are the seeds, but we are rotting. I don't think we'll ever grow again, end quote. Here, like with Snowpiercer, we see the identification of people with plants. As seeds, the silos contain potential for a new world. But in order to truly realize that potential, they need to escape the discipline imposed upon them by Silo 1, which controls the information, and we later learn, the gas that keeps the passage to the outside world unimpregnable. As two of the characters discuss, quote, They put us in this game, where breaking the rules means we all die, every single one of us, as a species. But living by those rules, surviving by obeying them, means we all suffer. Even worse, we're perpetuating their legacy. End quote. The silos represent the hope for a new world, but it turns out that Silo 1 only has plans to allow a single silo to survive. The more conscientious relationship to the earth and the non-human represented by the tomato burial scene and the radical potential of the new societies of the silos is betrayed by the overarching nefarious plans of the old world and its extractivist exclusionary way of thinking. While the graphic novel does not extend this far, the novel series concludes with the escape of the residents of one of the silos into the wider world, hinting at the possibility of a radical future being realized. It is through food and the agricultural system, a, a relationship with which philosopher Hub Dijsselbloem argues is always compromising, that the eco-utopic imaginaries of these post-apocalyptic worlds are revealed as compromised by their politics of exclusion and their invocation of Anthropocene-inflected attitudes towards the non-human world. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome any questions.